everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all again so much for joining us today for the Phase 2 Plan and Grant Application Webinar. My name is Alex Notbaum. I am the Senior Research and Data Specialist from the Office of Public School Construction that's working on the Regional K-16 Collaborative Program. The Office of Public School Construction is underneath the state's Department of General Services, which is the department in charge of administering this program. Today's webinar is going to be led by the Foundation for California Community Colleges, which is the program's third party administrator that's been selected to administer the Regional K-16 Education Collaboratives Grant Program with OPSC. Um, and if we can go ahead and hop over to the next slide, um, we're going to start off with just an overview of what this grant program is to discuss the purpose, how to qualify, and the required outcomes for the grantees. Then after that, we're going to dive into the details about what we're all here for today, which is the phase two planning grant. We're going to walk through the project timeline, how to apply, and the different applicant resources and sections um, that you all should be aware of. Just a few quick housekeeping items. Please put your questions in the chat or raise your hand for questions. We're going to have have lots of time at the end for questions uh, at the end of the presentation. We also are recording today's webinar and we will be sure to post it and share it sometime within the next few days so that you can share this information with all your partners who might not have been able to be here today. So with that being said, I will go ahead and pass it on over to Foundation. Hi everybody. Um, so my name is Beth Kay. I'm one of the directors um, that's leading this program with the foundation. You'll hear from Jody Samuels, um, who is the other one. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about is the larger grant program itself. So the grant program itself is, is to support regional K-16 educational collaboratives. The intent of those collaboratives is to create the streamlined pathways from high school through post-secondary and into the workforce. Um, there are some required qualifications, but before I get into that, I just wanna be very, very clear that these um, program requirements are about uh, the program overall. So it's even though what we're gonna talk about a little bit later is just this planning grant, and very specifically your application to get planning grant dollars, it's really important that you and all of your partners understand the larger purpose of this grant program so that at the end of your planning process, you are actually well positioned, you and your teams, you and your collaboratives are well positioned to, to make an application for an implementation grant in phase two. So required qualifications. In your partnership, when you're ready uh, to do your implementation, you have to have at least one K-12 school district, at least one University of California campus, at least one state California State University campus, and at least one California Community College district. You must establish a steering committee with at least 25% local employers, and you must commit to participate in the California Cradle to Career data system, Right now, what that looks like is K-12 districts will be um, working with the California College Guidance Initiative, which we refer to as CCGI. Next slide, please. So this um, set of work, this program is linked to, to much larger work across the state. Um, and it really is driven by um, the recovery with equity recommendations that come out of the governor's office. So a requirement of this grant program is that you will implement, your collaborative will choose and then implement at least four of the following seven recommendations from that recovery with equity report. So the bullets are here, but I am gonna read them. Um, so you need to commit to improving faculty, staff, and administrator diversity, cultivating inclusive, engaging, and equity-oriented learning environments, retraining students through inclusive, or retaining students through inclusive supports, providing high-tech, high-touch advising, support, supporting college preparation and early credit, subsidizing internet access for eligible students, and improving college affordability. Any four of these 
are recommend are the recommendations that your collaborative needs to commit to. Next slide. The other very big piece of the required work of a, a K-16 collaborative that will win a um, implementation grant is to create accelerated degree and credential programs that incorporate work-based learning in at least two of the following sectors. So your collaborative needs to choose two of these four. You can choose more, but at least two, healthcare, education, business management, engineering, or computing. And the intent of your planning grant period here, this year that, that you're applying for dollars right now, is to get the appropriate partners in place to be able to move toward both um, choosing and committing to these occupational pathways and choosing and committing to the four out of seven recommendations. Next slide. So there's some additional grantee responsibilities around reporting and evaluation. We like to make sure you guys understand this um, up front. So the reporting and evaluation components, actually Alex is our, our contact person for that, but you'll regularly track and report on progress as a part of the grant agreement. So if you are awarded dollars in the implementation grant, you will need to know that you'll be collecting data and submitting it regularly. You'll participate in evaluation activities, including conversations with us, site visits, um, and eventually case studies that we write um, for the larger purposes of the grant program. Um, and, and some technical assistance will be offered um, in addition to site visits from us at the foundation, as well as folks from OPSC. These, these pieces, I just wanna reiterate one more time, the pieces that I just went over are not components of things that you will be doing during your planning grant time. All right, so we're going to go over really specifically the planning grant, but we thought it was really important that you understood the, the larger um, expectations and purposes of the grant program itself and the implementation grants that will follow the planning grant. Okay, next slide. And I think I'm going to be turning it over to my colleague Jody for the next pieces. Yes, thank you, Beth, and thank you, Alex, for kicking us off. Hi everybody, my name is Jody Samuels. I'm the Director of Strategic Support for Colleges and Scholars at the Foundation for California Community Colleges. And so with Beth, we are the two co-leads um, as the third party administrators to support OPSC in administering this program. So in terms of the grant program overall and the number of awards, you can see here the number, total number of awards and the funding amount. So we have already completed phase one, which was the first phase of the funding, and there were nine awards made of $18.13 million each. And one thing that's important to keep in mind is that we are using the SURF regions that were already defined by the state of California for this program. So the SURF regions that were awarded, there were nine of them, the Central San Joaquin Valley, Inland Empire, Kern County, Los Angeles County, North State, Orange County, Redwood Coast, Sacramento, and Southern Border. There are a total of 13 SURF regions across the state, and it's very important to note that the current awardees who received an award in phase one are not eligible to apply for this phase two planning grant. So for the phase two planning grant, the amount of funding available is $100,000 to $250,000 each per award, and there are four remaining SURF regions that are eligible, and those are Bay Area, Central County, Eastern Sierra, and Northern San Joaquin Valley. In terms of the project timeline for the planning grant, again, we want to emphasize this is for those four SURF regions that did not receive an award in phase one. The application is now open and it is due by October 3rd, 2022. And we anticipate making the award announcements on October 28th. Again, note um, that applying for and or receiving a phase two planning grant is not a prerequisite for 
uh, a phase two implementation grant. And it is also not a guarantee of receiving a phase two implementation grant. So of course, the intent is that this planning grant gives sort of nascent collaboratives some time to work together so that they can prepare to submit a competitive implementation grant next year. However, it may be possible that a collaborative that is working together does not apply for a planning grant or does not receive a planning grant. That collaborative could still apply for an implementation grant next year. And likewise, there could be a collaborative that receives a planning grant, but perhaps is not able to complete all of the work necessary to be able to apply for an implementation grant next year. So we just want to emphasize that this piece of it, it's not a prerequisite and it's also not a guarantee of receiving that phase two implementation grant. And then the milestones that are listed here, as Beth mentioned, these are the milestones overall for the K-16 program that are written in the um, Budget Act statute. And so even for those collaboratives that are entering the program in phase two, these are the same milestones that will need to be achieved throughout the entire implementation period. So by June 30th, 2024, any of the collaboratives that receive an implementation grant must implement two of the target recovery with equity report recommendations, fully establish one occupational pathway, and demonstrate progress toward the other recommendations and pathway. And then by the end of the grant period, which is June 30th, 2026, all of the collaboratives are expected to fully implement all four of their target recovery with equity report recommendations, and also fully implement both of their selected occupational pathways. In terms of the applicant resources that we have for applicants for the phase two planning grant, we have their K-16 website available for you and a bunch of resources are on there and, and we'll, I will talk about them a little bit here and then I'll actually go over to the website to show you where they are located. So there are application guidelines. There is an application template, which is a Word document, so that as you're working on your application, you can work in a Word document and then copy and paste it into the online application. It tends to make things a lot easier if you can work in Word and share it with your partners rather than trying to do things directly in an online form. So we wanted to make sure to provide that to applicants. There is a budget spreadsheet template, which you will need to complete and upload into the online platform. There is a work plan template, which also will need to be completed and uploaded into the online platform. And then there is a link to Submittable, which is the online platform that we use for the application process. The website will also have this webinar presentation and a recording link, as we've mentioned a couple of times, and I know we've been getting questions in the chat about that as well. Uh, we will be posting those within the next few days once we have the recording edited and ready to be posted, as well as the webinar presentation. So I'm going to now switch and go over to the website. Hopefully everyone has had a chance to look at this, but I am going to just do a quick little uh, tour of the website. So let's see, make sure I've got the right one. Okay. Uh, and I'm just looking at my colleagues. Are you now seeing the website? Okay, great, thank you. It's always good to verify because I have multiple screens open and I just want to make sure people are seeing the right thing. So right now what you're looking at is the K-16 Education Collaborative Grant Program website. And over on the top for phase two, if you click here on phase two collaboratives, this is all of the information about this phase two uh, collaborative process and the planning grant. It talks about how to qualify, it gives some of the key dates, especially for the planning grant, which is what we're working on right now. And then there will also be, as we've mentioned, an implementation grant, which will be happening next year. Application information in this middle section here, this is all of the resources that I was just talking about. So you have application guidelines, which when you click on this, you will get a PDF that you can download and save. The application template, as I mentioned, is a Word document so that you can actually work on preparing your responses in this application template before needing to submit them in the online platform. The budget template and instructions, this will download for you an Excel spreadsheet so that you can complete your budget. 
And then the work plan template and instructions is another Word document. And it has a sample work plan. Um, please be sure when you are completing your work plan that you actually delete the sample before you submit your work plan as part of your application. And it does say that in the instructions, but we like to just emphasize that. And then when you are ready to apply, you will click right here on click to apply. And this will bring you to the submittable platform. Okay, and just to verify again, everyone should now be seeing the submittable platform. Is that right? Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so this is a submittable platform. And I'm going to actually go back to the slide deck for just a moment before I walk through the submittable platform, just so it's a little bit easier to see that. So give me just one moment here. Okay. So this, uh, as I mentioned, applications must be submitted through this online platform submittable. Please note that no applications will be accepted by email, for example. You will need to create an account for the primary submitter for the application. It is possible to add multiple collaborators, and these collaborators are other people on your team who will have access to the application to help work on it, to review it as you're completing it in the platform. However, the primary submitter is the person who will receive any automated notifications from the submittable platform. And that is something to keep in mind when you're determining who will be the account holder for the primary submitter. You are also able to access submittable technical support and the help center when you're in the platform. And one of the things that's important to keep in mind is Submittable does save automatically every minute or so, but we also always recommend that as you're working on your, your application that you save draft while it's in progress, and then you'll be able to click apply when you are ready to submit. And so the application sections that you will see, um, and these are also in the sample application template, the Word document, so you'll know what to prepare before you get into the platform. There's an application cover page. There is an application contact information, required collaborative partners contact information. And I want to pause on that for just a moment. So we noted earlier that there are some requirements for collaboratives that are not expected to be met right now by some of the planning grant applicants. However, we do expect that planning grant applicants have already identified the four required educational partners that Beth mentioned earlier. So there is a section on the application for those that required collaborative partners contact information. Section four is where you'll spend most of your time. That is the proposal narrative, and it is a series of questions. And then there are required attachments. There are three required attachments, the budget spreadsheet and the work plan, which I mentioned earlier, and also a list of your collaborative partners. And that should include the name of the partner and the primary contact information. Especially for the planning grant and for this one year planning period, certainly we anticipate that there could be other partners that will be added throughout the year. But this list of collaborative partners that you submit with your application should be your current list of partners that you are working with to plan this collaborative. All right, and so with that, I'm going to go back to the submittable platform and I'm going to walk through a little bit of the platform so you can really see how it looks. Okay, so let me know if, if, I will do it this way, let me know if you're not seeing Submittable, otherwise I will continue on here. So when you first access Submittable, you will see Foundation for California Community Colleges. You will notice we actually have multiple applications available right now because we also administer some other grant programs. So what you will look for is this one that says Regional K-16 Education Collaboratives Grant Program, Phase Two Planning Grant. And then you will click on Apply. And you will need to sign in. And I'm going to sign in. I'm already uh, logged in, of course, as, as a user. And then this is what the actual application will look like. So you'll notice it does tell you the deadline, which is October 3rd. It gives some information about using this platform submittable. It gives a link to the Help Center if you need any technical support. It also gives a link to a guide for getting started as a submitter if you've never used the platform before, and another link to contact Submittable for technical support. As I mentioned, you are able to add collaborators, and there's a link right here to add collaborators, so if you're working on this with other people. And if you need for some reason to change your Submittable account's email address, we have a link for that as well. 
Um, as I'm going through, you'll notice in here that the version that I'm looking at actually has, let's see, this is a test. So let me just go ahead and hold on. I'm going to go out of this for just a moment and get into a better view of this to make sure that everyone is able to see the actual application. And I know we're having some questions come in, um, so it's great that the folks are folks are answering them behind the scenes. Um, and we will have time for more at the end. Um, let me just as we after we go through the submittable part. making sure I'm pulling up the right version. Since I'm an administrator on the platform, sometimes it looks a little bit different, but this is okay. this is perfect. This is actually what you all will see as users. So let me go ahead and share this. Okay, so again, you have all of this information about the Submittable Help Center and resources to connect with Submittable if you have any questions. And then, as I mentioned, we start off with section one, which is the application cover page. Um, and that includes, and like all of this is also in the Word application template. So you can prepare all of this information in advance. It includes a project title and a brief summary, the requested amount, which should be a whole number up to $250,000. You will also need to select the surf region. And you'll notice right here that there are only four surf regions listed. Um, as we mentioned earlier, only four of the surf regions are eligible to apply for this phase two planning grant. So if your region is not here, you are not eligible to apply. There is an information about the lead applicant organization and the type, the EIN, the address, all of the usual things you might anticipate for a grant application. There is also information for the legal signatory because we know sometimes the app lead applicant may not be the legal signatory, especially when you're dealing with a collaborative. So we are collecting that information separately. Section two, the application contact information is about the primary contact for this application and you can add secondary contacts as well. Section three, as I mentioned, is for the required collaborative partners. So that starts off with the K-12 school district. And then there is also the California Community College District. And scrolling down a little bit more, the California State University. And then lastly, the University of California. So these are the four required educational partners and we do expect them all to be identified even for the planning grant. Section four, the proposal narrative. Like I said, this is a series of questions and this is really the, the heart and soul of the application so that you can let the reviewers know what your plans are, what you hope to accomplish over this next year and how you are really anticipating potentially applying for an implementation grant next year and being ready to do that. So it, the questions relate to the plans for service within your designated your surf region, a description of your planned collaborative, a description of your general work plan. Uh, so this is additional narrative to supplement the work plan chart that you will upload as one of the required attachments. Also, there's a question around strengthening data use and participating in the cradle to career data system. We certainly know at this point in time, especially for planning grants, that there, this may not be a very advanced piece of your collaborative at the moment, but it's important to have a plan for how you will accomplish this because it is a requirement of the overall program. The budget spreadsheet, again, you will upload that spreadsheet as one of the required attachments. And this is an opportunity to provide a little bit more narrative to explain your budget. And then the three required attachments, you will see we have spots at the end here for your budget spreadsheet, your work plan, and your list of collaborative partners. And as I mentioned, you can save the draft at any time. And only when you are fully ready to submit will you click this button, apply. And one of the things I should also mention in the application guidelines, there is a section about how your, your application will be evaluated and reviewed and rated. Um, so that's something we wanted to make sure that was very transparent to applicants in advance in terms of the, there will be a panel of reviewers, they will be rating your application and there's more information about exactly what that will look like in the application guidelines. So I'm going to go back now to the slide deck. 
And I think that pretty much wraps up most of the presentation. Uh, so now, yes, we just have our contact here, K16 Collaborative at foundationccc.org. That is an email that you can um, send any questions to. Uh, there is also a link to that on the website as a, another quick way to send questions. And I'm going to look, it looks as though we've been getting quite a few questions in the chat, but then I think they are all getting answered. Oh, actually, I apologize. There was one thing I did not yet share, and I will do that now, which is the resources page on the K-16 website. That would be helpful just to point out to everybody, especially as we're getting some questions about the surf regions. So on the website, um, number one, there, I should have pointed this out as well, there are some FAQs already related specifically to phase two. So those can be found here. Um, there's questions about the, and they're organized by award information, timeline, eligibility, lead agency and fiscal sponsor, collaborative partners and considerations, program requirements, budget and allowable costs, and reporting requirements. So you can just click on the little plus sign and it will pop open those questions. And in particular, as we're getting questions during the webinar, if we're getting any new questions that are not already addressed in these FAQs, we will be updating FAQs um, probably within the next week or two. And then the other point part that I did not look show earlier is this resources page, and in particular the regional map, because I think we are getting quite a few questions about the SURF region. So SURF stands for Community Economic Resilience Fund Economic Regions Map. Um, these were defined by the state of California actually for another grant program that is also related to workforce, um, these SURF regions. And so the decision was made to align the K-16 uh, Education Collaboratives Program with those same regions. So these are the surf regions. You can see the map here. And you can also see the corresponding counties. And we've also noted in this chart which regions were funded in phase one. And so again, it is only the four regions that were not yet funded that are eligible for these planning grants. And I know there was a question. Let's see. I believe there was a question um, earlier about the name of one of them. and. On the surf map, it is called the Central Coast. Um, it looks as though we may have a typo in the chart, so we can fix that certainly, but it is Central Coast here. So this might be helpful for some of those questions that are coming in about the surf regions and, and what which counties they are included. And then the other thing I will point out under the resources is we also do have other program resources here just in general about the program. So we've already done several other webinars about the program and those are available here if you want to look at them. Um, the phase one application, that is probably a pretty good preview for what the phase two implementation grant application may look like. So could be useful to you as well as you're planning this year. And then there are also data resources, the data reporting guidelines, as well as a series of K-16 data metrics that all grantees will be expected to meet if they receive an implementation award. And then there is also a learning agenda and a logic model for the program. And these are also just very helpful resources to better understand the full program overall. OK, and with that, I will now go back to the slide deck. And if we do need to go back to the website to show anything else, I can certainly do that based on the questions that we're getting in the chat. All right, so Beth and Alex, is there anything that has been asked that we should think you think we should answer verbally? Or I know you've been, you and Cesar have all, all three of you have been answering questions madly in the background here. Um, so just let me know if you think there are any that we want to emphasize and, answer, and talk about or discuss. Jody, I think there was one question that was asked earlier that hasn't been answered yet. Um, and the question was, can there be more than one planning grant in a single SERP region? I think that that, that is a possibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We did answer that. And it is true that more than one can be funded during this planning process with the intent, the very clear intent, that there is a single competitive application that comes um, for the implementation grant. So um, only one grant application will be funded in the implementation phase. It's important to remember that. So if you're considering working in subregions for your planning and your application for the planning grant, please know that in the end, in these four regions, only a single grant will be 
um, funded per surf region. Um, Jody, can you also show the part of the um, the website that has the lead applicants uh, that were funded? Oh, certainly. so the question that came up: there are a couple of folks on the webinar um, who are currently operating in the regions that have already been funded. So we want to make sure you guys can see where to find the uh, the contacts for the the currently funded. Um, collaboratives. Yes, very good point. So on the website under phase one and phase one collaboratives, this is where there is a chart of all of the phase one grant awards. So it shows the lead applicant, it shows and it shows the region. And so this lets you know which regions have already been funded. There is also a link to a PDF of project summaries for these phase one grant award recipients. So if you are wondering if you are eligible based on your region, this is a very good list showing which regions were already funded. And also, as I mentioned on that surf map itself, in the chart below it, we did indicate which regions have already been funded. There was also a funny question that I don't think any of us picked up on about the surf regions themselves. Uh, it looks like on the map, and I'm, I haven't checked yet, for Eastern Sierra, the map covers seven counties, but the list mentions nine. So what I can say to the person who, who requested that information is that uh, we will double check and get back to you. Um, it looks like, sure. yeah, that's seven. And mm -hmm. right, so we will make sure to check that. Yeah, um, Yeah. I think, I think that I agree. Oh my there may be. <laughs> There may be duplications because Central San Joaquin Valley certainly does include Fresno, and that's also under Eastern Sierra. And Madera, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I would I would use the map, um, not the list. Yes. But we, we can gets cleaned up. Yeah, and we can make sure we update that pretty much immediately after the webinar today. Yes. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, Uh, there's there's a question here about work plan. Should the work plan reflect sub regional activities, or should those roll up to the regional work plan? Um, we're looking for a single work plan for your work, what you are applying for, dollars to support. So we don't want separate work plans for individual groups. If you are if you are applying for dollars to support your work, there should be a single work plan to achieve that. Um, let's see, I'm still scrolling down. Um, the example work plan indicates quantitative targets. Um, and that's some of the work that this group is planning to do. How far along should those targets be? Um, in outline for planning versus implementation. This, it looks like we might need to dig into this one a little bit, but um, Alex, I don't know if you wanna chime in on that one in particular. Yeah, I can definitely address that. For the planning grant itself, what we're looking for and related to the quantitative targets um, is, as you said, a lot of that work is going to be done during the planning grant of collecting data and developing a plan to uh, figure out how you're going to meet a lot of the quantitative outcomes for the implementation phase. So for the application purpose, if we're looking for something more along how, what targets do you plan to collect or just information more about um, what your plan is to start collecting those quantitative targets. If you already have baseline data to include, that's great. Um, but again, we understand that a lot of that work will be done during the planning grant as well. So it's more just about the plan to get to those targets. Great, thank you. Um, this question is about the difference between phase two planning grant and phase one implementation grant. It says, can you explain a bit about how the requirements and intent of the phase two planning grant differs from phase one implementation? So um, the, the two sets of implementation grants are essentially the same. There's a phase one that were already funded. The list is on the website. 
Phase two will be coming next year, okay? The requirements for those are essentially exactly the same. This planning grant is intended to allow folks in the regions that haven't yet been funded to get themselves organized and ready to apply for the phase two implementation grant. That's the intent. Uh, this was uh, negotiated and figured out with OPSC early in the process because we recognized that not all the regions were prepared um, to apply for an implementation grant on such a short timeline early on. So we wanted to <clears throat> make sure there was a way for regions who weren't yet ready to implement to organize themselves through this planning grant process. So that is the intent. And if you read the application, the, the, the requirements and expectations are built into the application itself. Um, I hope that answers your question. Is there a limit to the number of planning grants funded? Um, I don't know, Alex, did you wanna take that? I don't, I don't think we discussed that in particular as an exact number. Um, the intent is, again, I'll, I'll reiterate this, that by the end of the planning grant period, no matter how many planning grants have been funded in a surf region, that that work across the surf region ends in a single application for that region for implementation dollars. So I, I hope that makes sense. If, if it doesn't, please ask another question if I didn't understand it completely. Um, the terms, okay. Uh, Is there any advice in terms of data usage that you would like to advise us on as a result of having implementation grants up and running? Uh, just trying to focus on our efforts based on what you have learned thus far. Um, we're, we're not expecting that any planning grant folks are, are changing anything about what they're doing based on uh, the implementation grants that have been funded. This year is for you guys to figure that out we don't have any recommendations around how you should be um, submitting information or data or your work plans based on what the implementation grants have done. Um, I'm continuing to scroll. Uh, would a region then apply to an implementation grant in 2026? No. Uh, there, so, Jody, you probably know the dates off the top of your head. The phase two implementation grant application window is on the website. Yes. Um, but it's about a year from now. Yes, exactly. It's it's almost, I'd say almost exactly a year from now, I believe. And if if um, folks look at the website under phase two, um, there is actually already just a, a very brief timeline for the phase two um, implementation grant. Um, so let me just pull that up quickly. Uh, and it is almost a year, exactly a year from now. So phase two implementation grant, we do plan to launch that grant application on September 1st of next year. Uh, and then, and actually here, I can just go ahead and show where this is on the website as well. So it's right under how to qualify. So under process and key dates, uh, we have first have step one, which is the planning grant, step two is the implementation grant. Um, so this is what we would anticipate that most applicants would that would follow a two step process again, as we said earlier, however, it is not a prerequisite to receive a planning grant to apply for an implementation grant next year. And if you do receive a planning grant it's also not a, not a guarantee that you will receive an implementation grant. But the implementation grant timeline is right there September 1st for the grant application to be open, it will be due October 3rd and then awards will be announced roughly on October 28th. Um, I'm looking at some of the additional questions. So I think we've answered that one. The work plan sample includes ultimate desired impact, numbers served, and outcomes and evaluation measures. Should those elements be included in the planning grant work plan or can they be deleted? That might be something we probably want to take a closer look at before we answer that question. Um, 
since there are approximately four grants to review, when do you expect to release news of this, uh, the, the competition? We don't know that there will only be four grants to review. So there are four regions left to fund, but we have not said for the planning grant purposes that there are only four grants to be awarded. So there may be many more applicants than just four. We don't know. Uh, there will only be in the implementation phase four grants awarded. Um, so when is the announcement? The anticipated timeline is that the planning grant would be announced October 28th. Mm -hmm. Which I think is also on the website, am I right? Yes. Um, portions of our region may better align geographically and historically with other colleges in other regions. Any guidance on how this can be addressed in the planning grant? Oh, Cesar is typing an answer. Um, and then there's, it looks like there's a question that just says required by state law or administrative policy decision. I don't, I don't know what that refers to. Um, so maybe the person who asked that question could, okay, we could answer this live. Well, we could just thinking to clarify perhaps. Yeah. So, um, would the person who asked that question, it looks like it's Joe Radding, like to ask your fuller question? I think we can unmute you if I'm not mistaken. I don't know how to do that, but someone at DGS may be able to do that. If you I ready. believe I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm sorry. I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't understand which of my multiple questions you wanted me to clarify. So there's one that just says required by state law or administrative policy decision question mark. So yeah, it was a it was a follow up to your answer that I didn't think was clear as to the use of the surf regions. I uh, asked if it if the use of the surf region was required of the regions was required by state law or by an administrative policy decision, and if so, by whom. And the answer I received from you wasn't clear. Okay, so um, many of us are answering questions, so I don't actually know exactly what what uh, was written down in answer. I can but, tell, I can read it to you. Okay. Um, so I originally asked, is the program required by law to use the surf regions or was this a policy decision and by whom? The answer I received was yes, the program requires to use surf regions. Well, I get that. Of course it does. It requires it in the application materials. That didn't really answer my question, though. I see. Um, I, I think we're going to have to go back and research that. My, my suspicion is, based on our conversations, we, we're the third party administrator, right? So a lot of the decision making about what this program and project were, were decided long before we got involved. Um, but my recollection is, is that it's a, a policy decision and it was to align with the larger surf work that's happening across the state. And when you say who, I would definitely have to go back and do some research for you on that. Um, and actually, and I will say to you, um, just to be transparent about this, it may be more of a question for our OPSC colleagues or DGS as the parent agency. Um, because those, again, as Beth said, those definitely were decisions that were made um, that we are just implementing as a third party administrator. So I don't know if any of our OPSC colleagues have any additional insight into that or, or maybe can follow up. Yeah, the money for the program was provided through the legislative process when the program got developed for the, the 250 million that was made available. So OPSC worked with the administration, including the governor's office, on determining the best way to, to administer this program. And we, like as Beth men, we we did align with the surf region and the other the other state initiatives going on at the same time. So uh, Joe, I'm not sure if that completely answers your question right now, but we we can uh, as a a group commit to making sure you do get an answer. I appreciate that. It does, to some extent, answer my question, although that last comment 
cause me more confusion. Um, but that's okay. I'm probably pushing deeper than, than I need to be. You're welcome to follow up with an email too. If you have more detailed mm -hmm. questions that you're looking for, you can send us an email as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so some additional open questions. Uh, Cesar is answering the one about the historic and regional associations. Um, I'm curious to hear more about the evaluation component. Is FCC leading evaluation efforts in each region or should each region be prepared to do that on their own? No, each region is not doing their own evaluation. You, you do not have to plan for that. Um, OPSC is leading the evaluation efforts and I'm, I'm gonna kick it over to Alexandra to talk about com the components that she wishes. But again, please remember that the evaluation components, data collection components, specifically what we shared today are about the implementation grants. So we, um, maybe Ella, Alexandra, you can say a little bit more about the planning grant. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just to reiterate what Beth has shared for this planning grant phase, there's not going to be a major evaluation data collection component. The priority is to get the plan in place for the implementation. So once we're in the implementation phase, each region will work um, with me and with OPSC to develop a evaluation plan for every region. So that's something that we will definitely work together on at the implementation phase, but it's not something that you have to worry about as of right now. But if you're thinking in the future, each region will not be responsible for doing their own evaluation. That's something that we will work together on and OPSC will be taken care of. Um, it looks like somebody's Word document is opening in the middle of the screen. Um, okay, so, oh, good, there we go. <laughs> the work plan template. Um, so another question, Eastern Sierra does not have a UC in the region. How should an application handle this in forming a collaborative? So this was a, a very big question during the implementation phase as well. Um, you might not have an actual UC campus, but you may have, um, uh, a center or a component of UC that is operating in your region. So that's one approach. Another approach is to go to um, um, the nearest UC campus. Um, and so that, that's the case for uh, the North State region as well, um, and potentially Redwoods. So the closest one being UC Davis. So this is something that's come up frequently. Um, for the planning grant, you, you will need to have some representation. And I think if I'm also not mistaken, maybe Jody, you can also show this. Um, there are a set of contacts from UC. Uh, mm, I'll have to look at it. Uh, it could be under resources, it could be under phase one, but it's um, context specifically for UC outreach. So these are specific individuals at each campus that um, are available to, to work with different folks around any outreach activities. Um, we definitely put it in the FAQs, you're right. Um, let's see the question, but I think, and there, yes, I think there is a, a spot we just, have, yeah, we can, we can certainly follow up with that. And we will be sending, um, once we have updated the website with the link for this recording and the presentation, we will also send, uh, an email blast to everyone to let folks know the website is updated. So we can also, uh, make sure we, we look at the follow-up on that, any, or any of those questions as well.
And I wanted to go back to, for a moment also to the previous question about the work plan template. So mm -hmm. keep in mind the sample provided is very much a generic sample of what a work plan could look like. Um, so if there are parts that don't apply or aren't as relevant to your planning grant, you do not need to, you know, sort of fill in things just for the sake of filling them in. Um, for example, there's the ultimate desired impact, the um, number served project objective. Um, certainly would still want to know what is your desired impact for this planning year. Number served, um, it would still be helpful probably to get a sense of the number of students or participants you would think to serve if you get an implementation grant. So that could still be helpful if you're able to make that estimate. And then activities, timeline, and outcomes and evaluation measures, those certainly are pieces that also should be included um, in terms of what activities you're planning to do over this year, what is the timeline for those. And for the outcomes and evaluation measures, it doesn't necessarily have to be quantitative the way it is in the sample where it talks about, you know, a 25% increase in something or 5% increase or anything like that. This is, these are just samples of that type of information. For, for the implementation grant, um, most likely that type of quantitative data will be more important. But for the planning grant purposes, the outcomes and evaluation measures could be something more about bringing together the right partners, enlisting the, um, making connections with with employer partners to make sure that you could have at least 25% of employers as part of your steering committee. It could include something related to the types of meetings you might have with partners or the outreach you're going to be doing to the partners in terms, um, it could include also something around how you're going to strengthen your ability to collect data. Um, so those are the types of outcomes and evaluation measures that would be very relevant for a planning grant. So I just wanted to clarify that. I think there was maybe a little confusion about the sample that was provided and it really was meant just to be a sample. Um, it's not meant to be something that you follow exactly. So hopefully that helps to clarify that question. And th thank you very much. I knew we had that that link to the, the contacts. And I, there was a link to a Google Doc in the FAQs under phase one. And I think that's the where that is. So that should be helpful for folks who might need to reach out to some of those UC campuses. Mm -hmm. um, so additional, would a region then apply to an implementation grant? Right, OK. OK, so we did answer that. Uh, it, Looks like we don't necessarily have any additional questions. Um, Sorry, I apologize people are seeing as I'm trying to sign in, but I just wanted to show that Google Sheet for the information just so people can see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. and this is the Google Sheet that is, and the link is in the chat. So thank you for the, the participant who posted that, found it before we could. And it is linked under the phase one collaboratives FAQs. Um, and so it includes the, um, UC leads, um, also some other regional consortia leads, which is a strong workforce program regional contacts, if you're familiar with that. Um, other contact lists, sort of in general, these are people who have opted in to be included here in terms of engaging these conversations. Some of them are most likely from regions that have already been funded, but some of them are the regions that are eligible. And then the SURF regions are listed here again as well, just for reference. And just a word about the the UC list that was provided by the UC Office of the President. So these are the official folks that you really should get in contact with from your region if you're um, if you're looking for you know who's the closest, which which site should we try to work with. Um, these are the best place to start. Uh, let's see. Given the goal of the grant is to build streamlined pathways from high school through post-secondary and into the workforce, what recommendations would you have for collaboratives interested in exploring and addressing inequities in K-8 that would relate to students' preparation? That's, um, I would say that's sort of outside the scope of, of what we would comment on. Um, we don't really have any recommendations around that right now. Uh, let's see. If multiple planning grants can be awarded per SURF, will the total of all the planning grants amount to? Um, the amount per planning grant will be um, evaluated through the um, application review process. 
and will rely heavily on what you're planning to do, your work plan. And so we can't answer that specific question right now. We can't say uh, each surf region will only get 250,000. We're gonna be evaluating that through the application review process overall. For the implementation, another, on to an, another question. Um, for the implementation grant, are you expecting that the entire region would develop the same occupational pathways or might one subregion build one occupational pathway and another subregion build others? Um, the purpose of the K-16 collaborative grant program is to ensure that regions start to make these decisions together based on their regional workforce and economic needs. So we don't have a dog in that fight. That's something that you guys really should be discussing together and making decisions together about. The four pathway types are the ones you need to choose from, but how your region gets to those end goals is up to you. Uh, let's see. It looks like we've gotten to all the questions that have been submitted. So I think we can kind of pause for a moment and see if there are additional ones bubbling. One thing I will also say, um, just that it's not a question here, but that we have been getting a few questions through the K-16 inbox is that, um, our role and the role of OPSC during this application process is not to provide advice or feedback on any part of the application. So this is a competitive grant program. It's a competitive application process. And so any questions that we receive, we, are, we will be including in the FAQ so that everyone can benefit from those responses. Um, and we are not able to provide specific recommendations or guidance to any specific applicant during this process. So uh, there's a good question here. Will these uh, current Q&As during the webinar be added to the FAQs on the website? Yes, they will. Um, we don't know on what timeline, but as quickly as we can. And, and we, will, we will go through them as well. And, and sometimes there have been some duplicates, so we will make sure that we are, are streamlining them as well and, and combining where appropriate. Mm -hmm. And if you have additional questions that you didn't get answered today, or just, you know, you think of them later, this contact, um, the K-16 Collaborative at foundationccc.org. Um, we have a number of people um, prepared to answer questions that come in through that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, please feel free to uh, send in questions to that email inbox anytime. And, and likewise with those questions, if they're new questions that have not already been addressed, we will add them to the FAQs as well. Like I said, it's, it's really important for this to be a, a transparent process in that sense so that all applicants are able to benefit from questions that other applicants may have. And I, I would suggest, although you know it might be difficult to filter out in your brain, I would suggest you go through the current FAQs on the website. Um, it's, it's worth really looking through those. Lots of the questions that you have have already been asked and answered. Mm -hmm. um, okay. and, we, and we do have the FAQ specific to the phase two part of this process. Um, so there is a, there's sort of a shorter list, I'd say, of FAQs on that page. There is a much longer list of FAQs under the phase one collaboratives, and those tend to be more specific to the overall program goals, I would say, in terms of what the milestones are and some of those other program requirements writ large, as well as some that were specific to the phase one application process. However, if you have questions about the overall program goals, they may also be answered already on those phase one collaborative FAQs. We didn't want to repeat them all on, on the second set of FAQs. So for the phase two FAQs, we've tried to really keep it more streamlined and specific to this phase two process. And I think there, there are a number of folks um, who have asked questions today um, about 
whether or not they can participate in this planning grant process and they come from um, some county that's actually already been um, funded in a CERC region. So I, I just wanna encourage you again to take a look at the lead applicant list that's um, on the website. There are contact uh, details there for the, those regions that have been funded. If you want to get involved in what's going on in your region, um, that would be the starting place to do it. Um, and, and all of this work is connected to the larger surf work. And so if you're interested in that, I think it was already put in the chat, but there's a link um, to the larger surf work across the state. Um, and that's getting organized now as we speak. The conveners are being uh, chosen and funded for that, which is more of the economic development side of the work. This education work is intended to feed toward that. So um, get involved. I think that's it. I don't think we have any more questions popping. It looks like we've we've gotten them. Gotten them. And again, we will, as we've said several times, we will be going through the both the chat and the questions that were submitted in the Q and A pod to make sure that we capture those questions to add them to the FAQs. Um, and I'm thinking, Alex, would you like to sort of wrap things up for us? Sure, absolutely. Thank you all so much again for taking the time to come out for the phase two planning webinar. And we hope to hear you all soon and at, hear from you all soon. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to reach out.